Hello there. So in this video, we're going to talk about doing cell count quantification or otherwise particle quantification in image J, also known as DG. This is something that I've done heavily in the last, uh, I don't know, four to five years because this can be done to quantify the amount of CFOS, a marker of neuronal activation in specific brain areas to verify that, hey, this brain area was more active in this manipulation compared to this other manipulation. Additionally, though, I've used it for quantifying the number of track traced cells labeled with retrograde tracer injected into one brain region and taken up backwards up to the origin inputs in other brain regions. So in this guide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you in the description where to skip to if you just want the quick run through because this first part is going to be the more detailed explanation of why we do each step so if you just want a quick run through to follow along again just check the description of which time part to skip to additionally i'll also display the protocol on screen so that people can kind of take just screenshots or snapshots and use it for their own purposes rather than me having to post some sort of file Via a link. So let's dive into it. One moment. Get rid of me for a second here. If it will allow. All right. So here's the protocol. And as you can see, it's modified a decent amount from various other labs. Uh, this is a protocol we use for CFOS quantification when I was working with Dr. Kent Barrage. And this protocol is in particular what was very helpful uh, in streamlining our process for the paper, uh, Con et al. 2020, where we quantified CFOS across effectively the whole brain in order to see what turning off the ventral pallidum does as far as brain activity. So again, feel free to pause and take screenshots accordingly. I'm just going to scroll down. Okay, so we'll do a slow walkthrough of things kind of in this protocol, maybe a little bit of more explanations, but I'll be doing more of the live demonstration with the actual software. So let's take a look. First, one of the things I recommend is that you'll be helped out a lot if you know how big things are under the microscope. So when you have your microscope, with its, what I would assume, 10x objective eyepieces and 4x objective lens or 10x, 20x, 40x, whatever you end up using on the microscope. It's important to know what the real world size to pixels in the image conversion is. So a sort of calibration factor. So part of that's from the microscope and how much it magnifies things. The other part is the camera that you have set up with your microscope. So in order to determine this, some microscope softwares are installed with all of this information in there. So if you're one of those labs that has that, uh, search in your microscope software in case it's like able to control the actual microscope unit, because chances are the people that set it up for you did exactly that. However, if you are looking for a way to quantify it yourself because that information is not automatically set up in the initial software. You should procure, whether buying or borrowing, a microscope, mic 
micrometer calibration slide as depicted here. So this is a regular glass slide with some lines etched into it or painted into it. And these lines have divisions that are in real world units. So um, we're talking millimeters, fractions of millimeters, uh, almost the micrometer amount. Now, this is important because trying to measure everything in your pictures in pixels can get complicated. And also a lot of biological research requires there to be a little quote calibration bar shown in the bottom let's say right hand corner of the picture. So if you're wondering what this weird little white horizontal bar is at the bottom of some of these pictures that you see in journal articles, that's to tell you, oh, in the picture, this white line, its length corresponds to this many micrometers or this distance in the picture. So you know what the real world units are. It's also helpful to know some other things like knowing that neurons tend to be somewhere between 15 to 40 micrometers wide on average. That can vary a lot, uh, but that's usually sort of the, the standard size of medium size of neurons. And knowing that can help you figure out, based on that calibration, what to set the areas to later on in image J. So we'll see that in a bit. All right, let's jump into the actual practical stuff. So we have image J here. Uh, I opened up a multicolor image because it'll add some extra difficulty for demonstration purposes. In this case, I zoomed in on, I believe this is the lateral accumbens shell. And we have retrogradely labeled neurons in green here in this lateral accumbens shell, where we also have a blue counter stain that I believe was a neurotrace nissel stain. So in order to start this process, we can't just count them on this color image. There may be tools in order to do that. There may be co-localization things, but what we're more concerned about is making a very easy cut and dry process of just selecting out one color and then counting the number of particles in that color. And in this case, particles is synonymous with the actual number. Of the particles are synonymous with the cells. So, Let's go ahead and decompose this picture into its respective color channels. Well, actually, before I do that, we need to set the calibration for this picture. You'll notice in the top left white bar area, it says some properties about the picture. That is 2000 by 1700 pixels, and it's RGB, meaning red, green, and blue, so it's a multicolor picture, and the approximate size in memory. Now, we want to change these pixels to something a little bit more helpful. So I happen to know what the microscope calibration factor is in um, these pictures I took. And so I have that in my protocol. And I suggest that if you are drafting your own protocol, you write that down somewhere for people. So for instance, I took it down here for 5x magnification. And in case you don't have it for the other objectives, you can just kind of figure it out through division where for a 10x magnification, the pixel lengths per micrometer um, would be a difference of a factor of two. So <clears throat> in the case of 10x, it would be double this, I believe, because otherwise this would be halved over here. You wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be covering as many micrometers for every pixel, but there would be a lot more pixels per micrometer is kind of the way to think about it. So I just have it for 5x because a lot of these images were taken at 5x. And even at this lower magnification, the staining was bright enough in order to quantify it and take pictures very quickly across whole brain sections. So we see the number 0.777, and this is for pixels per micrometer. This is what we want to use. So we're going to go ahead and program that into image J. Let's go have at it. So we want to go to... Uh, analyze set scale and so we see here we just put in 0 0.777 and then the known distance corresponds to the unit you're converting to so that's one micrometer we want to change the unit to just um for micrometer in this case remember mm's for millimeter and the pixel aspect ratio we'll keep it at one to keep things simple 
but not all pixels, especially via certain microscope cameras, not all pixels are created equal. For instance, uh, when we think about aspect ratio, you might remember, oh yeah, um, I know that a lot of TVs these days, they put out 16 by nine as their aspect ratio. So we know that it's not a perfect square because it goes 16 across by nine units up. And the same thing can happen with pixels, as weird as that sounds. Pixels are not always perfect squares. Sometimes they are slightly rectangular. For instance, when we go back to the protocol, the calibrations I had for the microscope told me that uh, it was 1.285 micrometers across, but 1.289 micrometers vertical. So that's not a perfect square. It's almost a square. And it's close enough that I decided to not have the aspect ratio anything other than one. But if you want more precision for whatever reason, you ought to figure out the uh, difference between these to convert your aspect ratio. I imagine that the difference is pretty much like a 0.999 kind of difference between these, if I were to hazard a guess in the units. But again, we want to do things simple, so we're not going to worry about changing the aspect ratio. We're going to keep it at one. Uh, we're going to click global. And we're doing that because we want to, for every image we open in the same image J session, have this set. Now, the pictures that you're opening, unless you save versions of the pictures, it won't apply the scale to them. But if you are just kind of opening several pictures and doing your cell counts and closing them without saving anything, and image J is open the whole time, you want to just set global so you don't have to do this every single time you open up a new picture. So let's go ahead and just click that. So now, if we go back to the picture, we'll see something's changed in this white status bar up here, where it gives us the length and height in micrometers now. And it actually gave us a little micro symbol despite my typing U, which is kind of neat. And it also gives us in parentheses what that converts to in pixels. We still have it in RGB. And as I mentioned, we want to split the colors so that this program can kind of figure things out more easily. So to do that, we want to go color, split channels. Additionally, though, in order to do quantification with just regular uh, processing like we're going to do here, in any case, the image type must be a grayscale format. So it can't be color. It has to be grayscale. So we're going to go ahead and split the channels. And one of these channels is not going to be useful because we don't have any staining in red. So we're just going to ax that out right there. And here now we have the different channels. And it labels them on the top uh, bar of each of these windows which channel it came from. So this used to be the blue channel. This used to be the green. They've been both converted grayscale conveniently for us. And also, I mentioned how the blue is sort of this like fluorescent nissle stain, neurotrace stuff. And based on some of the features I'm seeing here a little bit more easily, it suggests to me what is going on here, that this tends to look like the lateral cumulium shell, uh, this is the anterior commissure, and this is a pyriform cortex in this very bright band here. OK, so you could keep this open in case you need to localize things for what you're doing. I imagine that when you're looking at a picture, unless you've cropped to your region of interest, you may need to draw it. This is part of the reason why we selected a setting scale kind of measurement conversion thing to get the micrometers in the picture in other words. And it's also good to keep you standardizing things. If you are counting something repeatedly in the same brain region, you don't want to just arbitrarily select different size rectangles at random for every new picture. If you want to keep things standardized, you want to select the same overall area consistently. Now, the exact location of the box will vary because the pictures might not all line up exactly in their center point, but at least the size of the region of interest in the selection box will be consistent. So that is one of these things I suggest for you in any sort of brain region or something that is consistently the same piece of tissue or same size of thing that you consistently make it that size. Maybe write it down in your notes, make some documentation on it. For the study that um, we had done CFOS counting with, I actually can pull it up right here, this paper. We have a list of the dimensions of brain regions sampled in micrometers. 
And these might seem like some very arbitrary numbers, but these are likely rounded up or down slightly based on trying to fit things within the nissel staining factor and uh, a little bit less concerned with how it matches up with the brain atlas. For instance, in the brain atlas, the anterior medial accumbent shell would probably be about 400 micrometers wide by 600 micrometers tall. In this case, again, we adjusted it down slightly based on trying to make the box fit it a little bit more tightly for our purposes, which you can do. But then once we picked that measurement, we stuck with this measurement for all anterior medial accumbent shell pictures. And that way we kept on counting the same general region. We weren't including other regions in those boxes. And we didn't have to worry about tracing the exact outline every single time. If you do have software to do that or do have the know-how to do that, feel free to do so. This is just a simple guide for trying to do that. You might be wondering, why even pick 400 by 600 in the first place? For that, I would refer you to the Rat Brain Atlas, which will tell us that the accumbent shell, according to the atlas, is about 400 micrometers wide by 600 micrometers tall, at least that part of the accumbent shell in this anterior extent of it. So we use that as our first range of numbers, and that's something good in case you're doing this brain research stuff and you're trying to figure out, okay, um, how do I know how big of a box to draw? You let the atlas inform you of such, and then you make a standardized note of, okay, this is the box size that I used, it has worked, let's continue using that exact same box size. You'll notice the lateral accumbent shell is not mentioned here. So unfortunately, we don't have something to inform us of this quite yet. And the picture I'm showing is not from this study, but instead something else that I'm working on actively as of this recording. So we're in a little bit more uncharted territory, unfortunately. Instead, what we're gonna do is we are going to select the approximate region that we have the labeling. Conveniently, the labeling seems to be mostly confined to the accumbens lateral shell. Some of it is bleeding into the core. So we're gonna to try to approximate, and you could do this based on also uh, the composed complete color picture. So let's, let's try to make the job a little bit simpler by doing that. Um, we can put these things back together and make a regular color picture. We go color, merge channel, no, color merge channels, image color, merge channels. And we don't have a red. We have a green, so we go green and green matchup, blue and blue matchup. We'll unclick the create composite because it'll create like a flat image rather than one that has like multiple layers. And maybe we'll keep the source images for convenience. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So now we have a third image of these composed back together, looking pretty much like how it did at the start and still has the units being carried over, as you can see. So now we at least have a little bit of info about the anterior commissure, um, an approximate outline of the cumbens core here. And I could select at least the, uh, uh, let's say, either ventral striatum or dorsal lateral accumbent shell, something like that. I'm going to pick the box to be about in this region where we have this labeling. You may need to extend the box to make it a little bit more precise after checking back with some things, but once you pick a box size, try to keep it standardized. It's really important to do that to make your measurements more accurate and less biased. All right, now that we have a box size, what exactly are we looking at here? Well, we'll need to copy some things in our notes. So it might be helpful just to boot up some sort of WordPad thing or Microsoft Word. So we'll just do, um. Do we have notepad here? No, let's do Microsoft Word. So we'll take down some of the measurements. I recommend taking down the following, and I do mention this in my protocol here. So let's take a quick look at the protocol again. It's somewhere in this earlier portion here. You want to take account of file name, the brain area of interest, the dimensions of the box in micrometers, the X and Y coordinates of the box in micrometers, and eventually put in threshold values and cell count. So I'm just gonna copy this as a template right here. Go ahead, 
Control C to copy, Control V to paste, slap that bad boy in there. And we're going to change some of these things to match what we have here. So let me shrink this out of the way. Our picture name is CTB plus NT, page 14, L Cumbins 9725. So yeah, kind of a lengthy process to copy the full file name, but it is necessary to make sure you're not mixing up anything. So in here, we have the full file name. In this case, my picture was cropped, but some of my other pictures are the entire brain section. So going from edge to edge, top to bottom, it is the full brain section rather than this cropped zoom in view of the accumbens and the area surrounding it. So in this case, uh, we have this labeled as such that it contains the accumbens and the surrounding ventral striatum areas, but some larger pictures may not have that. So again, file name is really important. We have the subject number in here. Uh, we have the atlas page number, and this is something that the person on the microscope kind of eyeballed to say, hmm, this looks like page 14, but something that you may need to double check later on. And other things I tend to add in there, uh, when I have these pictures is the slide number, if it's multiple slides for the subject, the section number on the slide going left to right, top to bottom in a reading format, things like that. These are important things to keep in your file names to make sure if you have to go back to the very same exact piece of tissue, you can find it and take another picture if you got to do that. Sometimes you only find out about that in the analysis after long after you've taken the pictures, but hopefully while you're still in the lab. So area. We're going to do, I'm going to say it's just going to be uh, ventral striatum, which would be STR for short, the box size. We're going to have to go into ImageJ to figure these out. We may be able to actually get to display, but it doesn't really hold it on screen. So let's go ahead and uh, go to Edit, Selection, Specify. And this will tell us what they are. So we want to do scaled units because that'll put it in the micrometer scale rather than pixels. If you leave it unclicked, then it's just pixels. We don't want that. So it'll give us scaled units. Uh, you can use either some very exact measurements or again, you could round them to being something a little bit more easy to use. So we could make it more like 900 by 850 because the cutups are a little bit arbitrary. And it measures the, I think it measures the top left corner of your selection box. So up over here in this area, uh, just to depict it here. Um, so the X coordinate in micrometers is about almost a millimeter over in the picture. And then the Y coordinate is only um, 20 micrometers, to, sorry, 200 micrometers down from the top of the picture. Let me double check that in a second. That does seem a little bit odd. Let's go ahead and move that all the way to the top. Image, edit selection, specify. Okay, yes, Y coordinate is now zero. So it's measuring from the very tippy top of the picture. All right, so let's go ahead and try to fix that as far as where it's located. So we got a little bit off it off screen awkwardly. You can grab anywhere, by the way, inside here. So if you have the selection, the rectangular selection box clicked, you can just grab inside the box to move the whole box rather than having to grab the tiny little edges or the corners. If you grab the corners, you'll notice it changes to a hand icon and that will allow you to stretch and skew it. You'll also notice while I'm clicking and holding, it shows the box size here. So for some reason, it's defaulted back to these measurements or to a different set of measurements, we're going to change that maybe a little bit. So let's go back to edit, selection, specify. So we kind of wanted it to be like, I believe we said 900 by 850. Then we got the X and Y starting units there. So what you want to do is kind of take these down. We've got box size is 900 by 850. The coordinate locations are, what do we have here? 
1042. I'm just going to leave out the decimal place for simplicity by 324. And then we're going to clear these out for the moment because we're not using these numbers just yet. All right. And then if you have a multicolor image, you might want to add another thing to saying color green for the green channel. So that's the one we're going to focus on. We don't really care about cell counts in the blue channel in this case, but you may at some other point. So we're going to hit OK. The reason why you copy all this info in isn't just to get the box sizes. And it, this also allows you, when you start up a new image, instead of trying to like draw it on the picture and then going back and trying to readjust it with the edit selection specify, you actually can go into edit selection specify right from scratch. So make the box disappear, edit selection specify. And if I just punch all these numbers in, it, it stored them automatically. So it just reselects the area of interest. But if it doesn't have anything selected, you just copy paste these numbers in. You can find the same region. And this can allow you to repeat cell counts with some different variables at play, like what your thresholding variable is, where they used uh, the, the watershedding process. Um, a lot of other things can be a factor. So that way you don't have to figure out exactly where you put your box, you have all that taken down in your notes. So that's what's important about trying to do this quantification. So I'm just gonna hit okay. And we're gonna stick with this box area here. So what now? Well, I mentioned this whole thing about thresholding and how it's important that we have a um, grayscale image as depicted here. So we want to go to image, adjust, threshold. This is one of the bigger steps here. So the thresholding process. We want to change the thresholding so that the dots or particles are what they should be. So right now the thresholding is isolating things so that, okay, sure, we, we see stuff here, um, but it's kind of an amorphous white blob. What thresholding does is that it says, okay, anything that is this shade of gray and above, anything lighter than that gets automatically turned to white. So all those shades of gray get automatically just clumped together as white color, absolute white. And then anything underneath that shade of gray gets suppressed down to black. So it turns all the colors into just binary, just either white or black, nothing in between. That way it doesn't have to figure out the exact boundaries, whether there's a gradient of color. So thresholding just makes this hard decision of forcing color to be one thing or the other. And that helps it do the counting process because it counts things that are the color of interest and not the background color. I've checked dark background here. I know there's some weird stuff that happens with other versions of MHJ, maybe older versions, where it counts the black particles on a white background. My version counts white particles on a black background. So if you get some weird results, you'll find out when we do the outlines part in a little bit. So we have uh, default. We don't really have like other settings here. I haven't really need to use some of these other ones. Um, we could kind of toy around with them to see what happens. Like we could do mean coloring. We could do uh, percentiles. These are just to like do settings. Uh, by uh, automatic processing, but we're gonna manually choose what the cutoffs are for anything darker than this turns black, anything lighter than this turns white. So we have two sliders here. We have the slider for things that turns anything below it black and the slider for things that anything above it is turned uh, white. So here, if we move this lower, this first slider, we'll notice this really kind of helps segregate the cells but also causes some of the ones with fainter labeling to drop off if we drop it down too much though basically none of the picture is going to be switched to the black background unless it already is a black background so if we put it all the way at zero everything is fair game to turn into white and could be counted we don't really want that so we want to make sure that we suppress things here we want to get rid of like any sort of non-specific uh, cell fluorescence in the background. We want to just look for the brightest stained particles here, but include enough that we get a good count. 
And so this is a tricky part because this is something that's hard to standardize between images, especially when they're, the labeling in a given brain area uh, might differ a lot. So with things like CFOS, there isn't a crazy overlap of cells typically, but with retrograde tracing, there can be a really dense labeling and other things that are not cells being labeled, like the axons, dendrites, et cetera, that make this process a bit harder. If you're working with CFOS, this part will be easier, but uh, with cell labeling and retrograde tracing, it's a little bit trickier. So we're just gonna kinda try to figure out the best thresholding lower limit for this. And I would say it appears to be around 190 something, 180 something. So we're going to put it at maybe 185 ish. Okay. Again, somewhat arbitrary, but I'm basing it on what I'm seeing here in the picture. If it's a bit too zoomed out, what you can do is you can click on the picture and then hover your mouse over the center of where you're looking at and hit Control Plus to zoom in on that part. Now we can kind of see what's going on actively in our region of interest only. So that's nice. Um, and it depends on where your cursor is pointing at in the picture, and that's where it'll try to zoom in on when you do the control plus and control minus thing. So now we can play around with the slider a bit more, see what happens. With retrogradely labeled cells, a lot of times it doesn't label the nucleus, so there'll be holes in the cells, and that'll be a factor to consider when it's doing cell counts. This program does factor that in. So we notice what happens when I keep upping the slider, and it gets to a point where when it gets too high, only the brightest things in the picture will get converted to white. Anything below that will get dropped out. So there are some particles in this picture that are so bright that they've hit the maximum, and that's why they're still appearing here, and not everything is black. Uh, and part of that's because I do some staining amplification in the tissue itself. So okay, we have to figure out the best range to pick here. If we have too many things, uh, if we have the threshold too low in this case, we'll have too big of a clump of cells. And even though the program can split up these clumps in a way I'll show in a bit, it can't do it perfectly. It doesn't know how to do it when the clumps are like a huge blob, like let's say this, it's going to have a lot of trouble trying to split all these up. It's not going to be sure what to do. So we want to try to ease that process as much as possible by dropping out anything but the most outstanding cell label. You might be kind of wondering, well, okay, but, but we're dropping out all these other neurons in the process. You could kind of play around with the thresholding a bit to get some of these dimmer neurons that are maybe in the upper right quadrant of this region of interest. So let's try and see what happens when we do that. We can drop out the really bright stuff and it causes the more grayscale stuff to be retained. It's not great though, because the way the staining works is that it kind of turns into a little bit more of a mess. So it's not something I recommend. It's just one of these things where the method's not going to be perfect and we just have to be satisfied with having a consistent way of doing it. So the threshold numbers I'm gonna pick in this case are again gonna be 185. And then you notice when I decrease this other slider, it says, okay, well, um, as we decrease it, this is capping off what can be in the white range. So, so if it's above that certain range, it actually doesn't get included. Uh, and we'll see that all these really bright spots get dropped all of a sudden. For instance, notice what happens down here with this one. When I tweak it down just a bit, now all of a sudden the insides are completely gone from that. Uh, so things that are too bright actually get dropped from the image. This may be helpful in case you get some tissue artifacts, like there's a piece of thread on your slide somewhere. It's like in the cover slip on top of the tissue. You can't get rid of it. You can kind of help delete it from existence using that trick. All right, and we've selected black and white just to keep things simple, but you could do like red or over under a certain threshold. I'm gonna just pick what we have here. And so we'll hit apply. And I'm gonna copy these numbers. So we've got dark background. 185, 255, uh, or sorry, 250, yeah, 255. You could also substitute like max in place because you know it's always going to be the same number for all of my images, for instance. I know. All right, now setting up the counting process. There are a few things to check off before we do that. 
we got our scale set, so we now have our micrometer measurements for the image. This is important because we have to figure out the area of select things in the image. I mentioned before that let's say a medium sized neuron is like between 20 and 40 micrometers, something like that. Um, we need to figure out what the area measurement of that is. So we have to do also a few other things before we have it just automatically do the cell count. When I go to analyze set measurements, it'll give us things like area, standard deviations, min and max gray values, mean gray value, things like that. We want to limit it certainly to the threshold. We want to redirect it to the proper image if we have multiple opens, so we'll redirect it to the green image here. You can also click on all these other things if you want to include them, but I don't find the vast majority of them useful. The most important one, though, is bounding rectangle. If you do not click this, it will count everything in your thresholded image. So you need to make sure that your selection is still present, and this one has disappeared, unfortunately, so we'll have to get it re-specified. Uh, we want to click bounding rectangle. We'll hit OK, and it'll keep these measurements while image J is open, and perhaps even after that. So I go back to image selection, specify. It'll plop it right back down where it belongs. We'll hit OK. Now, analyze particles. Some of you may be wondering, I talked about water shedding and I totally skipped it. I will show you the difference now between when you do and don't water shed. Additionally, if you don't want to measure particles, but you just want to measure the mean intensity of your region of interest, you can just go to measure and it'll give you the area of the selection, which you could also compute yourself by knowing what the region of interest box size is in micrometers. It will give you the mean intensity of each particle. Remember, this is a thresholded image, not the original. So it only has either zero for black or 255 for white. So the mean intensity appears to be 255. It's not really anything other than that. Standard deviation, zero, because you only have two options. In other images that are a little bit more complex, like a regular grayscale image like it started out as, these numbers would be far more informed. And the results will tell us the location of the box size in micrometers, again, the x, v, y. And then the width of the box size in micrometers, again, 900 and 850, with some slight variation there. All right. So again, if you have a, an image, you didn't bother thresholding it, you don't really care to threshold it, you just want to figure out, okay, what's the intensity of the stain? Because I've made the the intensity on the microscope the same for every single image I took. What's the intensity of this region if you can't count something in there? So you could just go to, again, analyze, measure, and it'll give you that. Not so helpful for a threshold image, though. I'm just going to close this. We don't care to save it. Instead, we're going to go to analyze particles. Now, we don't want um, pixel units because then it will go with pixels again. If we click the pixel units, it'll just again go with the 2000 by 1700 um, measurements of the, the image. So we're going to keep that unchecked. I picked these numbers kind of arbitrarily. So we want to, you may need to figure out based on a few trials which numbers are good. So when we say size, this is a restriction on how small and how big a particle, a continuous glob of pixels, can be in order to count it. We want to include holes as well. So if we have a circular uh, particle, quote unquote, in other words, it has a hole in the center, but it's still a connected circular line, or something that's more like a crescent, we want it to include what is within that. So in this case, we'll include holes for something like CFOS staining or CJUNE or whatever other immediate early genes that just label a whole nucleus you probably will not select the include holes thing. And for the area, assuming that a small neuron is no wider than 10 micrometers, then 10 micrometers squared is 100. Assuming that a neuron is no bigger than 40 micrometers uh, wide, then that would be, I 
than 1600. Yes. So that's a pretty big range. We're going to see what happens when we pick that. Circularity. How circle like can your particles be? Zero is a line, one is a perfect circle. We don't want it counting random lines. We want it counting things that are at least decently oval shaped. You can play around with circularity. We kind of default at 0.3 to start with. This is particularly important for those uh, stained nuclei, like in CFOS, because they may not be perfect circles. They're going to be more like oval shaped depending on the angle that they're pitched in the picture. So we, we pick 0.3, but that's definitely something you could nudge around accordingly. Just again, Whatever you pick, make it consistent across all your images for a given project. I also selected this, show outlines. It will create a new picture showing the outlines of what it counted and what it did not. So it will outline all the blobs that it counted and then leave out all the blobs it did not. And you can do a side-by-side -side comparison, as I'll show you in a second. We'll do summarize because it'll give us the mean particle area, intensity, other things like that, kind of helpful. You can click clear results to wipe out the results from previous particle analyses. We won't do that because I'm going to do a before and after comparison. Display results, you, you might think you want to keep that clicked on. That'll actually give you the results from counting and measuring every single particle that it decided to count. I don't find that particularly helpful. You may find that helpful, so you can click that on, but I, I don't really like it. All right. All the rest of these, we'll just kind of keep as is. We're going to hit OK. And now we got our image. Notice that it's, uh, it's kind of small. It's zoomed out to the full size image, but it only counted what was in the bounding rectangle. So let's go ahead and hover over in the middle here, zoom in, and then we could do a little bit of a side by side comparison. Okay, so we could see that there were a lot of things maybe in this portion that were not counted. Some things definitely down over here weren't counted that are clustered together. Other things over here were not counted. So that's not exactly great, but we also can see that it didn't count things that were too big. This is where that display results thing might be helpful in that it can tell you, okay, what is this giant glob particle, like this particle 37, I believe, here so let's go ahead and zoom way in 71 so in the display results dialog it'll give you a list of all these numbered particles and their properties it'll give you the area of particle number 71 and that looks to be uh, this one right here that i'm pointing out with my arrow so it would give you the area of that so that way you would know okay well if i have these cells clumped together and there are multiple cells uh, what's the sort of cutoff with how big of a clump it'll actually care about? So we see this isn't perfect. We'll minimize it for now. Uh, you can choose whether you want to save this or not. It says drawing of, and it shows you, you know, what it counted in the picture. May or may not be helpful. Up to you. Minimize, though. Here is kind of what we came here for. We get 92 as our count. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, it gives us the area of all the things it counted, so the total area of labeled stuff that was counted, the average size of the labeled particle. So we get the average size being about 200, which is somewhere between 10 and 20 micrometers, uh, probably between 10 and 15 actually micrometers wide. So kind of small, might be on the smaller side, but it seems to have accurately counted a lot of these smaller neuron areas. Uh, percent of the whole area. Uh, so how much of the whole area is it taking up? And then the mean intensity, things like that. But that's not it. We're not done yet. I mentioned watershedding. I mentioned how we could play around with particle sizes. So let's try this again. Let's say we make the particle cut off a little bit different. So we go to analyze particles and we say, okay, well, 1600 is good, but let's say that some of these were actually too small to be counted. What happens if we up this to 400 as our lower limit? Anything below 400 doesn't get counted. Well, creates a new outline, and as we see, it barely counts anything. So that's not good. So for on my estimate of, oh, neuron is about 20 micrometers wide, that might be an upper estimate in this brain region. The neurons might be smaller than that. And we see that it counts so few here. And this is generally a sign that you have that lower limit 
uh, as too high of a number. So we're, we're going to go back. This nine is not the right number. If we eyeball this, this is not nine labeled cells. That, that's absurd. So we're going to go back and fix that. Uh, analyze particles, we're going to make this back to about 100. Could lower it if necessary. 1600 didn't seem so large that it counted stuff that was like really huge. So that's not too much of a problem. Okay. Um, we're going to actually cancel that because I mentioned the next part of the process, the watershedding. Watershedding is one of the different processes you can use in the process menu on an image to help divide stuff. So we have binary, and it can basically force things to be a certain thing or not. You also have options to fill the holes if you need to, but since our counts include the filling of holes, we should be okay with that. Uh, there are other things that we can use here that I'm less familiar with, but we're gonna do watershed and see what happens to the threshold image. Watch closely in the image over here when I click watershed and see what happens. You should have noticed a bunch of little black lines being drawn and splitting up some of these blobs. Now, as you know, it's not going to be perfect, but the important thing is that it takes some of these things that are like three to 10 neurons clumped on top of each other and mathematically tries to divide them based on where it looks like they're budding off of each other. So it creates these divisions and makes it more likely to count each of these blobs. Now, even though they're not clean cuts, you have some things being cut in a really weird fashion, like this larger chunk here, it'll at least up the count to be more representative of what's going on in the section. Let's see how much it changes things just by doing the watershed. Analyze, particles, same numbers that I mentioned before. We're going to start with 100, go up to 1600, same stuff here. We hit OK. OK. Doesn't look like things are much different. Maybe some more stuff is counted. Let's look at the raw numbers. It has more than doubled the number of things it is counting. So that is outstanding, in my opinion. Uh, we are having more stuff included. And this is the number I'm going to go with in my records. So 193. So there, we kind of have that brain region counted. We're good. Let's do a quick comparison of the two drawing pictures here. So we got this and then uh, drawing this. We want to zoom that out a bit, use the hand tool to move it into place. That's a pretty big difference. So these are about at the same zoom factor here. But we notice that um, there are many more particles for instance, in this region, down through here, even up here. So a lot more was included. Some of the stray particles in the periphery over here remain unchanged. One of them got dropped out for whatever reason. It probably got watershed and divided into pieces that were actually too small. So it can, in some weird scenarios, eliminate certain particles from being counted because it divides them below that 100 micrometer area uh, squared 100 square micrometer area limit that we've set. But generally, if we have a lot of bigger blobs that need to be split up, it'll do that for us. Now, this is still not the true number of cells that have been labeled. If that were really desired, we have to go in with um, probably confocal microscopy, probably at a higher magnification, and do it in a much more painstaking way where you go layer by layer through the tissue and spot by spot looking at different parts of your region of interest. So if that's need needed, you can use that and then do that again with image J. You can flatten these 3D measurements with um, a ZMAX projection. Image J does that too. That's something for another video. But we see the importance of the watershedding factor. Even if you're just doing CFOS where they should be about the same size, you get enough CFOS granules or I should say CFOS stain nuclei uh, in the same area, and they may be overlooked. So that is something to watch out for. And watershedding will help you eliminate that problem, especially since they're usually pretty oval shaped as it is. Okay, so like I said, you can choose to save these or not. Um, of course, it's extra file size when you do so, but not super necessary in my opinion, if you could just repeat the count. You want to have just a record of all the numerics that were involved. So box size, 
box location image, thresholding values that count, the full file name and area of interest and the color of the channel if it's a multi-color image. If not, you can leave that out. I'm just gonna close these. And yes, so that should be relatively satisfactory. You can also continue to populate a list here. Remember how I said to leave clear results unchecked when we were doing the analyze particles function? Notice how it kept adding a new line every time we did the function. So if you did this correctly each time, you could, in theory, just save this whole file rather than copying it down each time. You still run the risk of, oh, if you accidentally close this window, you lose all your data and have to do it all over again. So you might want to save often. But it also is a shortcut to having to write things down all the time or type in this case. So you can save things. It doesn't tell you the exact brain areas, though, because that's not labeled here. So we can't really just throw that in. Uh, but it gives us most of the information, including some other information we care less about. So yeah, that's um, one way of going about this. There is another thing, if you're not uh, analyzing particle count, it can give you mean particle intensity before you do thresholding. So that can be helpful uh, when you're trying to measure things as far as how bright each stain particle is. But again, that's sort of stuff for a different video and something I have described in one of my other publications, I believe. Okay, so I mentioned how I was going to do the fast walkthrough of how to do this. Uh, let's just make sure that we're not omitting anything from the protocol I had here. So I mentioned labeling, calibration, image type, knowing how big to draw your rectangle and where exactly it's located. Um, you can crop to the selection if you prefer. Just remember not to overwrite your original image. I mentioned very early in this document, hey, make copies of your original images because if you accidentally save one of these weird threshold images it, you can't undo it it's unfortunate um how we did the thresholding process kind of all it's described here and the watershedding process to split up blobs this one if you didn't crop the image but instead are just selecting one part of the image typo Analyze particles, the ones that I chose for CFOS type stuff, circularity, pixel units unchecked, outlines, display results summarized, things like that. Um, okay. And that's it. Yes, so I mentioned before, I'm going to do a fast track version of this. So let's go ahead and run through it. Just going to close this out. Don't save. We got our original image here. Going to close this out. And we're going to keep this open. And we have another few windows lurking here. We're going to get rid of this one and this one. OK, so this is a fast, fast track version. You have a multicolor image. You want to isolate the color that you want to have the labeled stuff counted in, the label stuff being part. So we go to image, uh, color split channels. If you already know what your uh, calibrations are, make sure that they're correct up here. If you don't have those in there, again, you can put them in the original image before you split the colors. And um, you put them in by going to analyze, set scale, putting in your uh, pixels per micrometer thing, making the unit micrometers hitting global to make sure that's applied to all pictures in the same session. The known distance is one for one micrometer for every 0.777 pixels, aspect ratio for a perfect square pixel, etc. This is what it should read out. It's great. So we have that set. We have it confirmed that it's set in this picture here up at the top. Uh, we want to look at the green channel. So we go through our window selection. We want to count what's in green. You want to know beforehand what the real world sizes now because we have this converted to micrometers what the real world size is of the region of interest i'm going to draw our rectangle with the rectangular drawing tool here we can check to see if it's the appropriate size by going to edit selection specify 
and this is the approximate size. I know that previously in other pictures, let's say this brain region, we want to count it consistently. We want it at 900 by 850 because that's what we decided on. See earlier in the video for that. We get the X and Y coordinates. We can move this by clicking on the picture. Hold on, let's hit OK. Clicking on the picture, making it a little bit more centered. Go back to Edit, Selection, Specify. And you can copy these numbers down in your notes for later. And making sure, of course, you have scaled units and micrometers clicked here. OK, so then we go to Image, Adjust, Threshold. We zoom in on the region of interest by hitting Control Plus while hovering our mouse cursor over it. Zoom out if we need to with Control Minus. We try to change the top slider so that as many cells are visible and separate from each other as possible. Another function, watershedding, will separate those later. We'll decide on 185 here, but this may vary between pictures. We keep the top slider at maximum in this case. We have it set to default. We have it black and white. We do dark background for my program, but if you get weird counting where it counts all the stuff on the outside, you might need to flip it around and do white background. We hit apply. So now it's set. We need to redraw the selection. We just go to edit, selection, specify. It'll automatically pop it right back in there. We hit OK. We go to make sure that our measurements are set. So we got area, standard deviation, min max gray value. If we were measuring that, we don't really need that mean gray value. Important check mark, bounding rectangle. Otherwise, it's going to count everything in the image. Limit to threshold, again, also important. We'll tell it to redirect to this specific image here. And we'll hit OK. You'll want to make sure that you copy down all the particulars of the picture that you've had so far. So file name, the color channel you're working with, this one's green, the area that you've boxed in, ventral striatum, the box size in micrometers, the box location in micrometers. This is determined from the top left corner. The thresholding parameters where we use dark background, first number is 185, second one is 255, or otherwise the maximum possible. We will get our count in a second. Analyze particles. We have to set some measurements. We want to know going in how big the area size of your particles are in real world measurements. We want to leave pixel units unchecked. Check your own protocol for what they should be if you're still trying to figure it out. Uh, change these numbers around until the area measurements are okay. Keep in mind, we want this is length by height to give us area. They're not just one directional measurements. Circularity. One is for perfect circle, zero is for complete uh, flat line. Uh, ovals are probably more toward 0.5 and up. So I pick 0.3, you might want to be more restrictive. We do select show outlines to give us a drawing that is of all the selected particles that were counted that we'll see later. Make sure summarize is checked. You can decide whether you want to click display results or not. Might be helpful when you're trying to calibrate this method. Only click clear results if you want to clear out the results every single time. Otherwise, if you don't click clear results, it'll keep on creating new lines on the same sort of table. And you'll be able to save that table later with all the results in the same file. This may be helpful if you want to save yourself some writing and typing. These particles have holes in them. Usually stain nuclei, like in CFOS staining, they do not. So CFOS staining, leave this unchecked. In neuron staining with retrograde tracing, we do check this in. And then we hit OK. As you'll see, I forgot to do the water shutting thing. So we're going to click this drawing out in a second. We got our count 93. Now let's see again what happens when we do process binary watershed. It'll do that. That's great. We go back to analyze particles. Everything's there from before. Hit OK. And we'll notice now that it gives us a more accurate number. So this is our count, the number that we want to put in here, 193. We plug that in here, and we have our area counted. We also have a drawing to compare against the original image, if need be, to see how accurate the counts were, what it counted and what it didn't. So you can do a quick check to make sure things look appropriate and to see if any sort of major swaths of labeled cells were missed. You can choose to save this or not. But at this point now, you are done counting. Again, I kind of goof there because I didn't include the 
water shedding function, you want to do that beforehand. So I showed doing the particles uh, with and without water shedding. You generally want to do the water shedding function before you do analyze particles. So keep that in mind. I'm going to choose not to save this thresholded image because we don't really need that. We could just recreate it again. We don't need to create more files. So don't save. Click this out. Click that out. And you can choose whether or not you want to save the table. You can save it after you've done several pictures and then done all the cell counts. But keep in mind that we'll only give you the file name um, and maybe not some of the other particulars that you put down in notes like what I have here. Okay, so that'll draw this somewhat lengthy video to a close. And I hope this has been informative. Again, trying to do cell counts automatically is not the most perfect process. A lot of people argue with it saying, no, we should just do it manually. But in order to drive the field forward, we have to do things in a more automatic process somehow. If we do everything painstakingly manually, uh, it's not going to be a perfect thing. Now, there are probably other programs that use different types of programming, artificial intelligence type stuff in order to do this in a much more proper way. That would be the equivalent of a real person doing manual counts. And that's all well and good. But if you're just trying to get a general gist of differences in labeling where, oh, we did this treatment and there's CFOS increase in this brain region. And then this group, there are control treatment, as in no treatment really, vehicle, if you will. And then we get this amount of CFOS labeling. The CFOS labeling in experimental group is more than the CFOS labeling in the control group. That is the gist that we want to get. We kind of want to get what the magnitude difference is, but knowing that it's a very significant difference between groups is probably the most important bullet point idea when it comes to things like CFOS labeling, less so than the explicit exact numbers. Now, in different fields, the explicit exact numbers may be a lot more important, so I don't want to overshadow that, but that is something to keep in mind. All right, that's it. See you next time.